Greetings and salutations. Thank you for clicking on the video. I certainly do appreciate it. In this video, we're going to take a look at what makes up a Linux desktop. We're going to talk about why there are so many choices and options when it comes to Linux desktops. And we're going to try and just get back to basics here because people who are coming to Linux for the first time, they might get quite confused about all of these different choices and environments that they can work in and then they start looking for information and they'll come across lots of debate about which desktop is best and people will talk about things like GTK, QT, display managers, all this other stuff. What are they talking about? Well that's what we're going to talk about in this video. When you look at a desktop like this you may be tempted to think that this is really one program. So what we're looking at here is GNOME 3, which is what I'm currently running. And we have a couple of applications open on the desktop. Got some nice wallpaper there. We've got, you know, all kinds of functionality. It'll do all kinds of stuff. This is awesome. You might be tempted to think this is one program. It's not. It's a bunch of little programs that are put together to give you an environment in which you can work in. Linux is very modular. You can change all of this out. You can change bits and pieces. You can uninstall something and install something else. If you are a developer, you could actually write your own components to put on a desktop. That's where a lot of these desktop environments come from. They use a lot of the basic components that are already out there and then people add to it. And it's really cool because it's very organic and it grows over time and things change. It's pretty awesome. But it's also confusing, especially if you're somebody who is used to working in Mac or Windows, where you really only get one desktop. This is it. This is what they give you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the basic components that make up a desktop. If you are already a Linux power user, you know, maybe you're a developer, maybe you know a lot about this stuff, please keep in mind that I'm going to generalize quite a bit. And I'm going to skip over a lot of stuff because the basic idea of this video is just to give newbies some idea of what's going on so they can kind of follow along when they're learning about Linux. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to use Wikipedia as our source and I will be putting the links to these articles in the description to the video. I thought it would be kind of cool to use Wikipedia because pretty much anything you want to know about Linux or Unix is available on Wikipedia. They have some pretty good basic articles. Now, this article <laughs> obviously has some problems, but there's enough there to tell you what's going on. The basis of the Linux graphic environment, doesn't matter what kind it is, is XORG, the X Display Server, also known as the X Window System. This goes way, way, way back and we're talking like mid 80s that X was actually originally developed. So X actually predates Windows. It predates most of the graphic stuff that you see on Mac. Uh, the original Macs and things, they were pretty basic graphics. Uh, this is a system that was designed for Unix and the Unix system of course is what Linux is modeled after. So Linux is a Unix-like system, so it can take advantage of X. X is currently the default display server for every single Linux distribution out there. Doesn't matter what desktop they run, doesn't matter what it looks like. If it's graphically based, it's using X. There is a new display server that is coming along called Wayland and that will replace X at some point. And the reason why they're doing that is because X is really, really old. And it's actually amazing that we get any performance out of it on today's modern computers, considering that it was developed in the 80s. I mean, really, honestly. It has been patched and coded, and uh, it's just time for something new. So that's what Wayland is going to do. So what is a display server? What does this do? What it does is it tells your graphic card in your computer what to show on the screen. And it's actually divided up into two parts. You have the server and you have the client. So the server is always waiting for instructions from the client. What do you want me to do? 
Now that client can be running on your local machine, like in this case, we're just on one machine here uh, and they're running together. Or that client can be on another machine. So what you can do with X is a, a thing called X forwarding. And what it does is it will actually allow you to run a graphic application that is running on a machine somewhere on a network. It could be on the other side of the building or it could be halfway around the world. It doesn't matter. And X will take the commands from that system and display them locally on your screen. So X is really designed to work in a terminal based environment because back in the 80s when you talked about Unix systems usually you had a big computer with a bunch of dumb terminals hooked up to it and if you wanted graphics the dumb terminal uh, could actually you know take those commands and display them so that is the X org server and uh, you hear a lot of people talking about X and how terrible it is and how they can't wait for Wayland and that's just what it does now X by itself is useless as a user you really can't do a whole lot with X on its own it needs a uh, some support programs to make it useful and the first support program that we're going to talk about is the window manager now the window manager actually creates the windows for the applications to run in it also creates things like menu bars buttons well the window manager controls input from the mouse it controls input from the keyboard and it takes all of this stuff and makes it so that the user can use applications running in a graphic environment do things with them like minimize maximize all that kind of stuff the oldest window manager there is for the Unix Linux environment is TWM called the tab window manager or Tom's window manager it's what it was originally called because of the guy who wrote it and it goes all the way back to about 1987 so it's pretty awesome it's actually still available. You can install it and you can configure it and you can use TWM. TWM is extremely basic. All it does is let you open up applications in Windows and see what's on the screen. And then of course we have menu bars, these uh, uh, buttons and all that stuff. That's all it does. This is it. So TWM is the most basic window manager there is. Now, before we get into other parts of the system, another thing we've got to talk about here is the X Display Manager. This is a program type. What the Display Manager does is it provides a graphic way for you to log into your computer and choose what desktop environment you want to run. So, in this case, they're looking, I think this is an old KDM because it's definitely changed. That would be the KDE Desktop Manager. Uh, Linux Mint has one called Mint uh, Display Manager. I, I interchanged the name of this between desktop and display. I realize that that's not necessarily correct, but I've actually read a lot of literature where this was referred to as a desktop manager because that's one of the functions here is that you can choose what desktop environment you log into so you can have your computer with more than one desktop you could have uh, GNOME, KDE, you could have XFCE all running together now sometimes that causes problems but technically you can do it and you can choose your desktop environment with the display manager and there's a bunch of them out there. There's LightDM, there is GDM, which is the GNOME or GNOME display manager, and then there's uh, KDE, and there's another one called Slim, which is actually pretty good. Uh, Linux Mint just went to LightDM. That's what it does. And this, all this does is give you a graphic way to log into your computer. You do not need a display manager. As a matter of fact, way back a long time ago, the way you would get into uh, your desktop environment on Linux was to type a command. Usually that command was start X and it would launch a script that would load the proper desktop manager. So the display manager just makes it all nice and graphic and does all kinds of really groovy stuff. So we have the basic system there. Now we need to get into themes and styles and toolkits because this is something that you'll hear an awful lot about. The first one we're going to talk about is GTK Plus. Uh, it's called, uh, was called the GIMP Toolkit, 
and that does go to GIMP as in the uh, GNU image manipulation program that you'll find installed on a lot of systems it comes from the same sort of place uh, what does GTK do it provides people who want to develop graphic software for a Linux system with a toolkit that they can work on. It's all of the widgets, the buttons, the decorations. It's, it's a platform for which you can write. Now, GTK has been around for a long time. That's part of the GNOME desktop environment. And so you'll hear a lot of people talking about the transition from GTK2 to GTK3. They talk about things like client-side decorations, that sort of thing. I will show you that at the end of the video. GTK is a very popular environment, and it's used by a lot of different desktops. But it is not the only one. There is also Qt or Qt. And this is pretty much the same thing, except it's a, just a different platform to write applications to. So essentially, KDE Plasma, they use the Qt environment, but you can run Qt on GNOME, or you can run GTK on uh, KDE, no big deal. It's just you have to have all of the support packages for that particular toolkit for these applications to run. So that's what they're talking about here. Let's jump into desktop environments. The king of them all in the Linux world is KDE, the K desktop environment. And when we talk about a desktop environment, we're not just talking about a desktop. KDE is also a suite of applications. So not only are they offering you a desktop but the applications to run on that desktop it's a huge project and it was it's the first of its kind in the Linux world it goes way way back to 1996 and the idea here is that we're gonna give you a complete system so you're gonna get the display manager you're gonna get the window manager you're gonna get a desktop you're gonna get a framework for which all of these applications run on all of this is coming in one environment and that's the idea behind KDE and KDE has this huge list of applications that are available that go along with it about a year later we got GNOME which is uh, nowadays being referred to by many people as GNOME but I've called it GNOME for 20 years and I'm going to continue to call it GNOME but as you can see Wikipedia is being very politically correct and they are showing both pronunciations so that's very cool now the gnome desktop environment is interesting in that it is used by a lot of other desktop environments and once again it's not just a desktop but it's a display manager uh, it's a bunch of applications that we have gnome shell it's a bunch of pieces that go into this and the curious thing about gnome is that when they went from gnome 2 to gnome 3 all of a sudden out of the middle of nowhere all of these other desktop environments popped up that were based on GNOME, like Cinnamon is a good example, or Ubuntu's Unity. They all used GNOME on the back end. They all used GNOME applications based on GTK. Many desktops out there are really using GTK stuff and a lot of GNOME components to give you a usable environment. For instance, when you talk about XFCE, which has been around for quite some time. There's a lot of GNOME components in there. It's GTK2 based. And when you talk about desktops like uh, Mate, which is actually the original GNOME 2 that was forked. I know it's M-A-T-E, guys. M-A-T-E looks and sounds like Mate, but the developers call it Mate. So there you go. But that uh, uses a lot of GNOME tools. So do a lot of the new desktops like Budgie coming along. So when you're really talking about desktops in the Linux world, these are the two big daddies right here, GNOME and KDE, which is just all of these applications that are put together to give you a working desktop environment. And all of the other desktops, in some way, they actually probably use a lot of the tools that come with KDE or GNOME anyway. With all the basics out of the way in this part of the video, let's get into a little bit of the nuts and bolts about how all this works. First thing I want to show you is X forwarding. 
and I have opened up a terminal and I have used the secure shell SSH to log into another computer on my network and the command that I used uh, up here to log in is not the one that you need to use <laughs> to actually get this to work but I wanted to demonstrate what would happen if you tried to run a graphic application so I'm actually logged into this other computer so let's try and run an application that has graphics so we're going to use grsync because it's just a simple little application and you notice it says no you can't do that because you don't have any display so let's get out of here and then we're going to use the X forwarding option in SSH to connect our X server to the X client so that we can do this. So to do that, there's a couple of ways. You can do uh, dash X, which will give you an encrypted tunnel for the X commands to go through. That way nobody can sniff what you're doing. And there's another version of that where you put a capital Y and that will also do it, but it'll be unencrypted. So we'll just use X this time around. So if you're if playing around with this and it doesn't work, try X, Y, it might be the encryption giving you a problem. So 192.168.0.12 is the machine that we want to log into. It looks and acts pretty much exactly the same, but we're going to issue the very same command which is uh, grsync. Now watch what happens this time. Well, the program opens right up and we're seeing it on the screen, but it's actually running in the other computer. So all of this uh, information here, it's referring to the other machine. Now this works for simple stuff. So let's say that I wanted to look at the printer configuration on this machine. So I could just check it out by just putting in uh, system config well, we gotta spell it right make sure there system dot config dot printers there we go and it'll open up and it gives you some feedback there on the terminal about what it's doing and I can check on the status of the printer you can also run things from a terminal with super user privileges by just adding this little command so let's do gk sudo and uh, then we'll do um, well let's see if this machine needs updating so I'm gonna run the mint update program from that computer and now it's going to ask me for a password and it's gonna run mint update and it's gonna go out and check for updates and see if the machine needs anything added and I can actually run the program and use it from here now, X forwarding is really cool and it's quite useful, especially if you're administering a bunch of machines on a network just like I'm doing. But there are some caveats here. First of all, you can't use really huge applications. Web browsers don't work through here because it, that, those sorts of applications that use hardware acceleration, they really need to have access to uh, the local video card. Because right now all we're doing is just sending commands to X to tell it what to draw. We don't have any hardware acceleration. So obviously a browser uses that and it wouldn't work. Uh, sometimes you can load a browser up. It'll take forever to load and there'll be lots of errors, but you can do it. But this is a, a fun little feature uh, and it demonstrates how XORG works. And usually when you close them, you have to uh, actually control C to turn all that off. And then once again, a little bug I've noticed here is that when you log out, it'll do the same thing. Control C, and now we're out. So that's how X forwarding works, gang. And it's actually one of the really cool things about working with X. And, you know, I've not gotten an adequate answer about how that's going to work when Wayland comes along, but I certainly hope that it still does because that's a tool that I use every single day when I'm working on my local network of machines. Okay, so I got two applications up here, and I wanted to uh, just talk a little bit about some of the odds and ends that go along with this. And this one is VirtualBox, which comes from virtualbox.org, and it is actually one that I downloaded directly from them, and it's written for Qt, and we have it running here on the GNOME desktop, and it looks pretty good. And then over here, we have a GNOME native application that's run running in GTK. And it really doesn't matter whether you're using like the KDE Plasma desktop. Chances are you're probably going to run some 
GNOME applications, and if you're running GNOME, you probably want to run some Qt. But one of the things that you might run into uh, with different desktop environments is how well these applications work side by side. So you'll hear a lot of times uh, people say, well, they, they have great Qt integration in this desktop. But what that means is, is that it's native GTK, but it runs Qt apps quite well. And so they look and act pretty much the same way. One, another thing that you'll hear about is something called uh, client-side decorations. This is something that came along with GTK+, plus, GTK3. And this is a, a, a different way of doing it. So we're looking at Qt here, and our window manager is providing this menu bar up top. And it gives us the basic functions of the menu bar. And we have a minimize and maximize button, and we can close the application and all that stuff there. It's pretty normal stuff that you're used to. With client side decorations, the actual uh, application itself provides these buttons, which means that you can integrate more sexy things in here, like menus and stuff like that. So we're looking at the disks application, and you see that we have this little menu that's integrated here, and that menu can do things it's it's actually sitting up here on this menu bar it's just ignoring the window manager and it's providing its own decorations so that's what that's called now you take Linux Mint for instance and they don't particularly like client-side decorations they they want to keep it to a more traditional interface so they actually have forked a bunch of apps that are called X apps which are actually really cool that are a more standard look they use uh, up here they'll have a, a menu bar and they'll have a, the menu like here these kind of menus whereas okay this is the Nautilus program which is the file manager in GNOME and you see it uses everything as client side so we don't have a, a regular menu that has file and view and all that other stuff it's all contained up in here uh, so that's what they're talking about when they talk about client side decorations my personal thing on it is I don't care uh, some people are really upset about this I don't I, I, I think some of it's pretty cool so, uh, you know, they can put like the buttons up here to select something or cancel something and it kind of keeps it out of the way and it doesn't have to open up a box that jumps up in front of it for that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's kind of cool. That's actually not bad at all. Now, with GNOME, sometimes it's hard to get these... I've noticed that when you first install it, and even the later versions, I've noticed this, if you would download the... Uh, VirtualBox application or VLC or one of uh, one of the other Qt apps out there, it wouldn't look right. It would not match up to what's going on, and that made me scratch my head for a long, long time. I was like, "How do you get this to work?" And finally, somebody out there in the community, when I was talking about it in a video I posted quite some time ago, said, "If you do this, it'll make it work." So I'm going to show you this, and that is so if you if you run in Qt apps and they don't look right then all you have to do is add this line to a configuration file called environment and basically it tells it what to do it says uh, qt style uh, it's uh, it makes it gtk plus so it overrides whatever the qt theme is and then it makes it gtk plus and it, it does that and that's all you really got to do to make it work and for the life of me, I don't understand why the GNOME project and, and several other desktops don't just have this included. Linux Mint does, so Linux Mint runs Qt apps quite well. But we're playing around in the GNOME world uh, right now, at least I am, and so therefore I have to make that change manually. But it took a long time to figure out how all that worked, and it's, like, it's a head-scratcher, even for folks who've been using Linux for a long, long time. Uh, the particular developers that put out these different desktops can have different levels of integration for different toolkits and it sometimes can come up with some goofy stuff on the screen. If you run KDE Plasma for instance uh, they actually have a setting in there where you can have the QT style be different from the GTK style because they handle them separately which in some ways is pretty cool and in the GNOME or GNOME desktop environment they don't so there you go and that's pretty much all I wanted to say in this video get just to point out you know why we have so many different desktops and why we have so many different choices in the Linux world 
because you can and it's all open source so people can use other people's work and they can build on it and they can change it it's pretty cool and pretty awesome that way and when you look at your Linux desktop I've said this in past articles and stuff like that you are really looking at the work of thousands and thousands of people around the world who provide these little bits and pieces that you see like the icon set here might have been done by somebody else the the this particular application has a different team of volunteers that are working on it the, the menu bar up here has certain part of the uh, gnome project is doing that it, it's really awesome it you you get this system that appears to be cohesive and works together and all that stuff but at the same time it is really this collection this hodgepodge and it all manages to work together that's something that I find very cool so uh, go off and read those articles if you want to and uh, be my guest look for more information because it's really one of the very cool things about Linux is the fact that you have so many choices so many possibilities and you can truly truly make it your own thanks for watching the video check out easy linux on the web check out easy linux on facebook and if you like it give it a like and also check out freedompenguin.com for lots of really cool stories about linux i just had one posted there about the latest linux mint so you can check that out at freedompenguin.com links to everything will be available in the description to the video i'm gone we'll do it again soon